there are many signs that God has given to us that are happening and unfolding before our eyes today. But transhumanism is a sign that brings us to the crossroads of time. So what do you think about going from human 1.0 to human 2.0? Has something to do with transhumanism, taking humans as we know ourselves and melding with artificial intelligence. We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. We've got something that can alter our genome. Making humanity 2.0 that is suddenly abandoning its ape-like behavior for an adult enlightened behavior that where the genes are not enhanced by mutation but they enhanced virtually by what we think we should be doing on the planet. Now in the past many tyrants and governments wanted to do it but nobody understood biology well enough. Think about it. You are self-replicating machinery now for the first time able to change its fate like a robot that can self-code, singularity. If they're altering the genome, this is a synthetic piece of DNA or RNA, okay? And if it becomes taken up into the genome of a human, it's synthetic, it's not from nature. And if you look at the Supreme Court justice ruling on synthetic DNA or genes, it can be patented and patents have owners. So what does that mean for us? What if this gets into our genome? Does that mean the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Department of Defense, all of these people who are involved in the patents, or are they somehow going to own part of our genome? You are the first generation that can change the fate of humankind by changing what humankind means. Surveillance under the skin is maybe the most important development of the 21st century, is this ability to hack human beings. Is this ability to hack human beings. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Greetings in the wonderful, glorious, perfect, most sublime name, that name which is above every other name. It is now, it was, and it always shall be. It is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, Yeshua HaMashiach. And welcome to another End Times for the Believers Bible Prophecy Update. As I share today's Bible prophecy update, I cannot help but to reflect upon the fact that it may very well be our last Bible prophecy update, and that not out of any giving up or quitting on our part, but the reality is, in just two short days from now, the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, will be celebrated. And if ever there was a time when the alert for the rapture was so high and is so high, it's this coming Feast of Trumpets. And so I hope that you are excited about this time. And truthfully, if this is our last Bible prophecy update because of the interruption of the Harpazo, then amen. Let it rip, Lord Jesus. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, the wise man declared. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1. In chapter 3, verse 17, For there is a time, there for every purpose and for every work. And in the 8th chapter, verse 6, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. But most fitting for today's message is the 3 verse 1, to everything there is a season 
and a time to every purpose under the heaven. We know, according to scripture, that time was not always in existence. As a matter of fact, God created time, and we see its initial entrance into the economy of God in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. He created time in order to accommodate a period by which he would build a kingdom for his dear son and for those who would become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He needed a epoch, a block of time, so that redeeming love might become incarnate, that he might complete that affectionate old redemption story. Daniel prophesied that there would also come a time when knowledge would increase. And we understand today, statistically speaking, that every 13 months approximately, knowledge doubles. And reading from an article from the Industry Tap written by David Schilling, the host went on to say that not only is human knowledge on average doubling every 13 months, we are quickly on our way with the help of the internet to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. Like no other period of time in history, this time of human history and of the church age is a time where knowledge noticeably increases. It would be an exponential growth of knowledge that would mark the end of time. And in a moment before we pray, I'm reading from Daniel chapter 12, which underscores there is much, I would say, prophetic material in the first three verses that I've chosen to quote them simply because they establish a prophetic time line. But the fourth verse is the focus of today's message. But reading beginning in verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The end of this period of time, the last days, or the end of days. Would you join with me for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, it is gladfully so that I come to you along with your children, not in our own name but in the righteous name of your Son. We recognize that in him we stand before you complete and whole and forgiven and in fact reflect the very righteousness of Jesus in our very beings. This is what you have done for us. Indeed, redeeming love has embraced us to the point that we are now referred to as the righteousness of God in Christ. Thank you for that. And in his righteousness, we stand with confidence before you, 
that you not only hear our prayer today, but that you promise to answer it. For we are asking of you for bread, for our daily sustenance. And Lord, you know that there are those who will be listening to today's program that are in great dire need and need a word of encouragement from you. So Lord, be who you are, a perfect loving father who cares for us with an everlasting love. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the very balm of Gilead, flow this day through this vessel of clay to the hearts and minds of your people. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And so we see from the prophet Daniel that there will be a substantial period of time, which the Bible tells us will underscore the the fruit of increased knowledge. And I believe that just this last week was one of those galvanizing moments when the fruit of increased knowledge was acknowledged or manifest by virtue of proclamation by none other than the president of this country, Joseph Biden, who made an announcement on September 12th, one that we made reference to last week and so will not regurgitate last week's message, only to make a couple of points as they reflect upon the significance of time in which we live. And if you will recall, it was focused upon the very subject of transhumanism. Karen Kingston, a former Pfizer employee and current analyst for the pharmaceutical and medical device industries, helps us decipher what's going on in this executive order, again, which was made on the 12th last week. Kingston stated in a Twitter post, I quote, Let me read between the lines for America. Biden's September 12th, 2022 executive order declares that Americans must surrender all human rights that stand in the way of transhumanism. Clinical trial safety standards and informed consent will be eradicated as they stand in the way of universally unleashing gene editing technologies needed to merge humans with AI or artificial intelligence. So what do you think about going from human 1.0 to human 2.0? Has something to do with transhumanism, taking humans as we know ourselves and melding with artificial intelligence? We humans should get used to the idea that we are no longer mysterious souls. We are now hackable animals. We've got something that can alter our genome. Now, in the past, many tyrants and governments wanted to do it, but nobody understood biology well enough. You know, a lot of this AI work uh, and the ultimate dream of software goes back all the way to 1950 uh, when Alan Turing uh, created the idea that uh, we should be able to match Uh, human capabilities in in many ways. If they're altering the genome, this is a synthetic piece of DNA or RNA, okay? And if it becomes taken up into the genome of a human, it's synthetic, it's not from nature. And if you look at the Supreme Court justice ruling on synthetic DNA or genes, it can be patented and patents have owners. So what does that mean for us? What if this gets into our genome? Does that mean the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Department of Defense, all of these people who are involved in the patents, or are they somehow going to own part of our genome? Surveillance under the skin is maybe the most important development of the 21st century, is this ability to hack human beings. Luciferase enzyme. When you get the luciferase enzyme, if you have a, an iPhone or a special app on the iPhone, you can scan over that area and it will give a digital code, a digital imprint. It also gives you an ID, a number, a barcode, a branding, whatever you want to call it, a tattoo. It's all the same thing. You now become like a product. This sign I recognize 
is most significant. However, let me add that this is not the ultimate sign. This is one of many, many signs. But this particular sign, I believe, is embraced in Daniel's prophecy that in the last days, knowledge shall increase. And thus, the sign of transhumanism underscores what I believe to be a reasonable assertion that there is a window of divine opportunity, that God, in placing this time constraint, bringing it into existence, put himself in a position where certain divine prerogatives must be exercised. There are, again, many signs that God has given to us that are happening and unfolding before our eyes today. And we'll be touching on some of those signs. But transhumanism is a sign that brings us to the crossroads of time. I believe this statement and this here executive order is stamped with time itself that it brings us to this point of time where time is winding down. And I believe that the rapture of the church is so imminent and it is almost imperative that it take place soon and very soon. And I say that for several reasons, one of which is noted here in Daniel chapter 2, In verse 43, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And so we see that in the last days, as it was in the times of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man, that one of the characteristics of that time is that there was gene manipulation, that man's DNA was being corrupted or manipulated by fallen angels and fallen angels technology. Now in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 16, we read the following, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So we know that there is coming a time and it is approaching us very, very quickly where man will of necessity exercise his God-given will. It will be a volitional decision that will make him in taking the mark of the beast uneligible for redemption. In Revelation 13 and verse 17, we read that, And no man might buy or sell save he that had taken the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so when that takes place and those individuals choose to take the mark of the beast, and make no doubt about it, there will be coercion. But ultimately, that person will have to exercise their free will and will take the mark of the beast Once again, every reason to believe that it will be something that manipulates man's DNA into no longer is he reflected, reflective of a man made in the image and likeness of God. He will be marred or corrupted forever. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ as man came to redeem man. He did not come to this world to redeem part man and part something else. And thus the enemy's strategy has been to so defile the human genome that man is no longer eligible for redemption. But there is coming a period of time where because of today's technology having to do with transhumanism, that there will come a point, and I do believe the technology exists today, where man will not have to exercise his free will, but there will be this type of, uh, of 
gene manipulation that will be imposed upon him without his own choice through various different transmission technologies, soon man will be forced to, through the air he breathes, and we see the technology today of chemtrails, and for those of you that have gone down that rabbit trail, and I have done so for 20 years now, there are some dark, dark secrets that lurk down there that has to do ultimately with fallen angels information and technology so that man is forced to breathe that which comes out of those sprayers if you will and the water he drinks and even the food he takes that there will be ingesting in man that mrna that technology that messaging technology that that manipulates man's genes could plant-based vaccines save the world? Scientists say rice, corn, potatoes, or lettuce can be used to produce antibodies. It's a kind of complex process, which uh, starts by uh, the procedure that infects them with uh, foreign uh, DNA, uh, genetic material that reprograms them to stop doing everything else and just make one protein, recombinant protein, which is a medicine that we want to produce. Biotech firms are already in clinical trials with their plant-based drugs or awaiting approval from health agencies. So the point is this, there will come a point in time that if God does not move, as we know he will, first by taking the church out of the world so that the Antichrist can be revealed and Daniel's 70th week can begin, if time progresses too, too far down the road, there will be no flesh left that is not tainted or corrupted or marred by this technology that we are hearing about that was galvanized in the proclamation or in the the executive order by the Biden administration. In other words, there is a shelf life. There will be a point in time where if the enemy has his way and he is incorporating the technology now and implementing it through greedy, wiki, uh, uh, greedy and, and wicked and uh, just proud, power-crazed human beings, the elite, the oligarchs, and he is implementing his strategy. Even now, the technology is all about us, and, and there's much that can be said about that, but for reasons unrelated to this message, it's for another day. So Revelation chapter 13 tells us that there will be the necessary exercise of free will, but that one day in the not too distant future, all of flesh of mankind, if God doesn't intervene, will become corrupted. And he will intervene just like he did in the days of Noah when the flood came, where the Bible tells us Noah and his generation, his family, they were perfect. They weren't perfect in terms of moralities, in terms of righteousness. They had their issues, but they were perfect in terms of their genetic structure. They maintain the likeness and image of God, and everything else was wiped away. We also have recent breakthroughs uh, like the gene editing technologies, including CRISPR. The gene editing tool, CRISPR, short for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindrome Repeats, could help us to reprogram life. It gives scientists more power and precision than they ever had to alter human DNA. This new power includes the possibility of making people smarter. Even before CRISPR, was used on human embryos, the technology was used to modify simple animals. There, the goal was to demonstrate that the technology worked. These experiments made us aware that with CRISPR, we could do a lot more than we previously thought we could. Scientists use CRISPR to change, delete, or add DNA to any organism, from a human embryo to a pig, to a wheat crop, 
CRISPR does this by subduing a specific part of the genome and then injecting a new piece of DNA into the genome instead. So CRISPR is an acronym for basically a system that is from bacteria that they use to kill and destroy the DNA of invading organisms like a virus. But we can now use that system to cut and change our own genomes. It's basically a, a DNA cutting enzyme that doesn't cut randomly. You can give it a barcode in the form of what's called the RNA molecule that tells where that enzyme will cut in the genome. Again. This technology is being employed right now to, quote, unquote, thin out the herd. You know, when I hear of so-called Bible prophecy experts, and I'm not judging their hearts. God sees the heart. Any, any statement that I make by God's grace is not with the intent to judge anyone's heart. As the Apostle Paul said, I have a difficult time judging my own heart. How can I judge another man's heart or another man's servant? But I must say that when I hear certain so-called acclaimed Bible prophecy experts make reference to their children and their children's children and future generations, I have this major block because I don't see time continuing on as we know it without the Lord first intervening. And yes, there are going to be future generations and they will come through the prophetic into the millennium period of time. But I am persuaded, fully persuaded, that this is the last generation, the generation that Jesus said, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And for those who seem to suggest that there can be certain preparations made in order to weather through the seven-year period of tribulation, once again, major red flags go up inside my heart and mind because what I believe is they don't have a clue as to the serious cataclysmic nature of the great tribulation. The Bible tells us much about that and that in those days, if they were not shortened, there would no flesh be saved. Biden brought in his executive order statements of future potential with regard to this technology, talking about the eradication of cancer and the elimination of various different diseases that have plagued humanity. And I want to say something in terms of that technology, which to a degree has already been, been utilized in and scientists' pursuit to reverse the aging process and a concerted effort to reverse man's aging process has been underway now for for a couple of decades at least. And it is a subject matter that has a, a, a code and falls under the heading, the Benjamin Button. If you were to do a search on the internet, the Benjamin Button, you would come across various different studies that have to do deal with the reversing of the aging process so that man can conceivably come to a place where he will live forever. The reality is, I believe, that those who are pulling the, the strings of control in the world, the club, if you will, the oligarchs, the elite, those that you hardly ever hear much about, but are the ones who really make the major decisions, they are the ones who they imagine will utilize this technology. And you heard a statement that was made not just two, two, one or two weeks ago regarding Jared Kushner, who believes that this generation is either the last generation that shall see death or the first generation that shall see eternal life through the, techno the technology. And so if these things be true, and they are being documented right now, and this technology is so far advanced, and keep in mind, they only tell us a small fraction 
of what's really in existence. Most of the information that is passed on to the world today is 15, 20, some say as much as 30, even 40 years old. The technology that is available to the secret groups is way beyond our imagination. Thus, we see how that the sound doctrine of the rapture is so much in play today that the window, I would call it the window of divine opportunity for God to move to inject himself into human society and history to prevent what will inevitably be man corrupting himself, God is compelled by virtue of time. Time, in terms of transhumanism, has a stamp of, of a window of opportunity. It's not the only prophecy that speaks to us about the closing window of God's opportunity to do what he said he would do beginning with the rapture. We see, for example, World War III. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4, we read, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. We see the beginning pinings of World War III. In fact, there are those who believe we're already in World War III. It just has not been officially announced. And that war is being fought between the United States and Russia in the land of Ukraine. And just this past week, further information has come out speaking of Americans on the front lines. And we'll say nothing more of that. You can do your own research but we are in a war against another power that possesses more nuclear capabilities than our own nation. What Vladimir Putin did is set in motion the events that will make every piece of territory where a Russian soldier currently stands Mother Russia in the eyes of Russia, which means any action undertaken by Ukraine or NATO against this territory, targeting this territory, becomes an act of war against Russia. What Putin has done is put it right in the face of NATO and say, do you want war? Here's your chance. I'm here. Russia's here. We're here. Bring it on. Because if you do, it's all over for you. Putin, it wasn't bluff when he said, we have the means to defend ourselves. We have better weapons than you. Everybody knows what he's talking about. Nuclear weapons. We are literally, you know, they have that doomsday clock. Yeah. There. You got to move it to one second before midnight. We're this close to the world ending. That close. Right like that. And soon China will enter into the fray. And we're not talking about bullets and guns. We are talking about nuclear technology, tactical nukes, the smaller devices, up to the full-blown nukes, which are able to annihilate countries in but a few moments. And what does the Bible say with regard to evidence that suggests nuclear war ensues? during the great tribulation, which we are seeing coming towards us right now. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, we see how that all the grass of the world is burned and vegetation. Verse 7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. This is worldwide devastation. And one cannot think of any technology that would have such a broad scope impact upon the world other than nuclear technology.
Revelation chapter 16, verses 8 through 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. This is, is an amazing focus upon the hardness of man's heart during the great tribulation. The point of the matter is men were scorched with great heat because of something that took place in the sun. And once again, we can only surmise that that which has protected us for all of our lives, the ozone layer, layer has been breached. And the the Detrimental radiant beams of the sun is scorching man. And again, men blaspheming the name of God, and yet they would not repent. No wonder, Jesus said, if those days are not shortened, there will be no flesh that survives. And if there were not some time stamp uh, issue or element on the war element, what about the one world government? We see today that the world is coming in full circle from the time of the Tower of Babel, where there was a united effort by mankind following the flood to join together to the point that the potential was so alarming to the Lord that he said, let us go down and confound their language so that they're no longer able to communicate with one another. Otherwise, they will become like God. And so we see a one world government that is being established before our very own eyes. And might I add that the Babylonian system, the world system, the one world system that found its initial uh, existence at the Tower of Babel, at least symbolically speaking, that it is not only or was not and is not futuristically, I should say, political alone. But in reality, there is a spiritual or a religious element and for the sake of time, I'll not read chap uh, Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. But there we read about the woman which sits upon a scar scarlet colored beast and full of blasphemes, having seven heads and ten horns. There we see the religious Babylon or the religious world system, the beast system, which many of us believe is right now in Rome itself. A very interesting development took place just this week with regard to the spiritual or the religious element, I believe, of the future religious Babylon. And it was regarding a edict or a proclamation made by Pope Francis regarding transfer of funds. Just this week, some of you have heard about it, maybe most, that Francis called for all funds anywhere and everywhere, if associated with the Vatican, to be transferred to Rome and to their privately held bank. The question is, what do they know that we do not know. I want to read from a certain individual's comments whose name I will not mention, but whose writings are, I believe, right on. He quote, I quote him, quote, The bells are ringing, not to call people to worship God, no, to call in the church's wealth before a coming calamity. Pope Francis put the word out ordering every entity affiliated with the Vatican to transfer all of their financial assets into the Vatican Bank by the end of this month. That means every religious order, every Catholic foundation, every arm of the Catholic Church anywhere around the world and has a hard date 
just a few short days away by the end of this month to get its money under the direct control of the Vatican. That means pulling billions of dollars out of Swiss financial institutions and top banks in London and Rome and Paris and the United States to what is called the Vatican Bank, unquote. And again, we, he states, quote, why is the Vatican recalling all of its money? The Vatican is basically a deep state institution. They get word of things before they happen. They have an apparent advance word that major economic collapse is coming. The author goes on to say, Russia and Ukraine are still at war. Actually, we are at war with Russia in Ukraine. China is still doing COVID lockdowns and is threatening Taiwan. Something has to give. Last Friday, FedEx stock dropped 20% overnight after the company's CEO revealed a major slowdown in international shipments and predicted a global economic recession. Like that is news. He goes on to say, it does appear that Pope Francis is preparing for an October surprise. The Vatican, for sure, is on the inside. They're getting the heads up about what's happening economically. They're considered their own little empire in this sense. They have wings in every country in the world, and that's what makes this decision by the Vatican, by Pope Francis, so important. It's every institution in the world, every church, every parish, they are about to be essentially separated in part because the money is going to be purely controlled by Rome. This is on top of what we know. A famine is coming that was manufactured, artificial, in that it was not just due to crop failure. It is due to government corruption, evil people. Add to this the prospect for war in Taiwan that you see over the weekend. Joe Biden said that we should deploy our U.S. troops now we're going to go to war in China. That war, according to analysts, listen to this, is slated to happen in October. So I don't think for a second this move was a coincidence or it's an ac accident. I think the Vatican is preparing to weather the storm to come. Many questions regarding this unprecedented act on the parts of of the Vatican and Pope Francis, who is considered to be an insider and part of the deep state based upon many of his contradictions and edicts that conflict with the very fundamentals of church doctrine. There's another consideration that has to do with time and the window of opportunity related to the Vatican. 900 years ago, a Catholic saint named Malachi was struck with a prophetic series of visions that predicted the identity of each future pope. Some of you have heard about the prophecy of St. Malachi. This ancient prophecy, buried within the Vatican for centuries, suggests that Pope Francis, the latest in the Holy Line, which stretches back nearly 2,000 years, may be destined to be the last pope. Listen to this. If Malachi's prophecy of the last pope is here, according to his vision of 112 popes, he envisioned the sequence of 112 different popes, which led to today's pope, and he described the characteristics of all of them, and they are uncannily effective and right on. He goes on to say again, according to his vision of 112 popes, Peter the Roman, Petrus Romanos. If Malachi is accurate, then Armageddon and the tribulation that he pastors during, it cannot be more than a single pope's reign away. How young is Pope Francis? And according to many in the Vatican itself, they believe in the prophecy of St. Malachi, who was ordained as a saint. 
canonized as a saint. And that it points to the current pope. He will be the pope that reigns during the most turbulent time of church history, which is known as the tribulation. Now, if that doesn't have a time stamp on it, nothing does. The question is, will we even make it to the year 2023? September 25th through the 27th, one of the highest rapture alert time ever. I myself, for those of you who have been following our ministry, I am of that generation where the late great planet Earth was written by Hale Lindsay, one of the most prolific and, I believe, right on teachers of Bible prophecy. Certainly in my generation, perhaps in all generations. And that book, The Late Great Planet Earth, was given to me in 1976 by a young man who had just come out of the Vietnam War as a young lieutenant who left for medical reasons, who had post-traumatic syndrome, could hardly hold his hands steady, and he knew that I was inquiring about things pertaining to God. We had had a conversation in that regard, and he gave me that book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And ever since that time, I have recognized that Bible prophecy is not only intriguing, but properly interpreted and compared scripture upon scripture. It provides scientific proof through mathematical probability, scientific means that the Bible is the inspired word of God. That young gentleman gave me a book and uh, his name, Neil Gallivan. I've lost track of that dear young man who's probably a couple years older than me now. Hence, I was, along with my wife, among those who in 1981, for example, Jimmy Swaggart was also sharing on this very subject and some others, including Jack Van Impe, that the rapture was possibly going to take place in 1981, which would be seven years before 1988. 88 from 48, Israel becoming a nation was 40 years, a full generation. And so we looked with great expectation in 1981 for the coming of the Lord. And once again, in 1988, there were those who felt that the Lord was going to come in 1988. There was even a book written, 88 Reasons for the Return of the Lord. And we were waiting then. And we have waited, my wife and I and those around us, have waited with great expectation for the coming of the Lord. But never before in all of my life, Has there ever been a period of time where a sense of blessed assurance, a deep abiding conviction that there is no other thing that I can believe but that these are the last days? And for that reason, Bible prophecy in terms of the rapture has become an exciting doctrine, a sound doctrine, which I believe because of the various different prophecies that have been fulfilled, beginning with Israel becoming a nation in 1948 and many other prophecies. And might I break for a moment here, just a few minutes ago, before I began this here presentation, there was breaking news. We want to update you on this right now. Take a listen to this. Israel's economic and military strength allows us to protect ourselves, but it also allows us something else. To strive for peace with the entire Arab world and with our closest neighbors, the Palestinians. An agreement with the Palestinians based on the two states for two people is the right thing for Israel's security, for Israel's economy, and for the future 
of our children. Peace is not a compromise. It is the most courageous decision we can make. Peace is not weakness. It embodies within it the entire might of human spirit. War is a surrender to all that is bad within us. Peace is the victory of all that is good. Despite all the obstacles, still today, a large majority of Israelis support the vision of the two-state solution. I am one of them. We have only one condition, that the future Palestinian state will be a peaceful one. Dividing of Israel and the consideration of a peace treaty which will be confirmed by the Antichrist. Are we not living in the last of the last days? All of these signs, and there are so many other signs that have taken place some time ago, which we have simply forgotten. They have passed our memory because so much is happening now. But what about the Revelation 12 sign, which was a very rare astronomical event in September 23rd, 2017, that never took place before, nor will it take place again. The alignment of the, the stars, the sun and the moon, which give a clear reflection. The Lord said there would be signs in the heavens and the sun, the moon, the stars. And sure enough, Revelation 12 was, I believe, a fulfillment of that prophecy of Revelation 12. And then there was the four blood moons that, according to John Hagee, referred to it as a consummate prophecy. Once again, these prophecies unfortunately, were mistakenly looked upon as the dates for certain events to take place. But a sign is only that. It's a sign pointing to something in the future. So we have the Revelation 12 already fulfilled. We have the four blood moons already fulfilled. And frankly, in each passing day, there's another strong argument that we are at the end of the end. These are the last days, and they are all pointing to something. And you know what that something is? It's this. This is what these signs are pointing to. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is Jesus talking. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's what these signs that we are looking at all about us are pointing to, the fulfillment of John chapter 14. What are these signs pointing to? These signs are pointing to this. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be harpazo, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Could we be seeing the reflections of the Feast of Trumpets? What we are seeing is an event that will take place in the very, very near future that is a sound doctrine. Jesus said that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. It will be fulfilled. What are these signs pointing to at? These signs are pointing to this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Friends, it stands to reason 
that these are the days that we are called upon to look up. When you see these things begin to come to pass, then the time has come to look up. In a moment, I am going to be sharing what I believe to be a personal word from the Lord, the captain of our faith, the captain of the Lord's host. And I believe that as a faithful captain, he communicates his encouraging words to his soldiers who are embattled against the very powers of darkness. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You know the rest of the passages right there. So it stands to biblical sound reason that he as the captain of the Lord's host would communicate a word to those of you who are on the battlefield, the troops, if you will. And I believe he has given to me a word of instruction and encouragement to share with you at the end of what I'm going to be closing with. But first, I want to say something. Last week, we were blessed on our Facebook Sheep Song Ministries. We have had now well over 30,000 views, which for us is substantial. And we ask that you would share the message and use it as a tool, as an evangelistic tool. Some, many of you have done that. You have shared this message. And I am happy to report, and I want to, to focus on one specific individual, as blessed as we are to see that kind of traction. And again, we have talked about the, the way we are held back on YouTube. The ratio is like maybe 2,000 to over 30,000 and other, it just... We are being censored big time. But when you, God's people, take the time to share a message, don't worry about what others might think of you. This may be their life raft. This may be the thing that gets them to make a decision in their hearts unto the Lord. I was blessed when a certain message was sent to me by way of of text, of email, and it was four words. And those four words brought tears. I wept when I heard these four words. This individual said this. I prayed the prayer. I prayed the prayer. That is one of the fundamental reasons why we are about this ministry, why we share the gospel and Bible prophecy update, which the two go hand in hand, that we might reach the loss for Jesus Christ, as well as to encourage the saints to keep fighting the good fight of faith. This man said it all. I prayed the prayer. There are some of you that are listening to me today, and if you do not Pray the prayer from your heart and mean it. You are lost. You will be lost for all of eternity. And you will experience, not because of God's will, the will of God is not that any perish, but that all come to repentance. But what will take place, undoubtedly, is you will incur that which was determined and prepared for the devil and his angels. And again, it's called hell. And it's a real, real place. And there's no getting out of that place. But you have a chance today to do the same thing as that man did. He prayed the prayer. And if you are ready and you are tired of running away from the Lord, and you don't understand all of this stuff, but you're ready to give the Lord a chance to prove to you that he is the living God, then I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it from your heart. Would you say this? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this day knowing that I am a sinner and confessing to you that I have sinned against you. I have done many shameful things through my life, things that would give you reason to cast me into hell, But I believe you sent Jesus to 
take my place, to die upon that cross for my punishment, to atone for my sins, and that through his blood, you are able to wash away all my sins and to cast them into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west so you are able to cast my sins away and so today Lord I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord I believe in him I believe in what he has done for me and I open my heart this day and I invite you to come into my life by your Holy Spirit and to make me the person that you want me to be in Jesus name. Amen. If you prayed the prayer and meant it, I'll be seeing you in the clouds, I believe, soon. You'll be like that person on the tree where he said, Remember me, Lord, when thou enterest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Little did he know the Lord meant every word of it. And he was in paradise that very same day. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. See, Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. That's the reason why you listen to today's program. And now the word of the Lord. I realize time is a little progressed for me, but I do not want to take away from this word. So please, for the next few moments, bear with me and see if this is not a word from God for you as an individual. It is a word that comes out of Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38. And I consider it a word from the captain of the Lord's host to his people on the battleground, the field of life. And this is what he says, and we'll, we'll extract it from these next few verses. Verse 38, now it came to pass as they went, that he, the Lord Jesus, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she come and help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful or anxious and troubled or disturbed about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. What is the word of the Lord for his people today? Yes, indeed. We have many troubles about us. The Bible tells us that when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up. May I submit to you that Mary, who was at the feet of Jesus and heard his word, was looking up. To look up is not to simply gaze at the stars and to just wonder, though we do at times. This is a posture of the heart, looking up to Jesus. This is a word of encouragement that tells us, cast all cares away, knowing that he cares for us. This is a word that tells us to lay all our burdens down. For there is one thing and one thing alone that is needful, and that we can choose that. And if we choose that one thing, the Lord promises no one will take that away. We may be 
subject to many external things and circumstances, but one thing we are not subject to is that our hearts, if we choose to look unto Jesus, to wait before him, before his feet, to worship him for the person that he is, no one, not the devil himself, not life nor death, nor anything, Paul said, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so, yes, that is the word of the Lord. Look up or be like Mary, not troubled about many things, but choosing one thing, and that will not be taken away from you. May God bless you this week. I may be seeing you in the clouds, but now we are going to close my daughter and I by singing a special song that I believe very much characterizes this very word with regard to Mary, Mary being at the feet of Jesus. And that's what this song is about. It speaks of that special holy consecrated place where the world is shut out and there is the, the shield of God while we engage in our love relationship with the Lord our God, our Maker. Be blessed in Jesus' name. You are my
until we meet again, and it may very well be in the clouds. Maranatha, my good friend, Jesus is coming. He is coming soon. He is coming very, very soon. Amen, amen, and amen. Be sure to check out some of our other videos below, and don't forget to like and subscribe. God bless.